Hey guys, it's Nick with Basic Gear Review, and today I'm on the way to El Cajon. I'm going over to the Taylor Guitar Factory to check out some cool new stuff. Specifically, I'm going to be looking at the um, new Grand Pacific series of acoustics, and of course, we'll be checking out some of the basses as well. So, tell you what, let's figure out where I'm supposed to go. I don't really know yet. Turn left on North Rice Avenue. So, just made it here to San Diego, El Cajon specifically. Check out where I'm staying. Uh, look at that. Taylor Guitars putting the dude up for the night. Training coming up here in a little bit. Just waiting on the bus. But uh, I'm gonna get my stuff and I'm gonna check in. Brought the old Fender Precision as well. Should always be practicing. All right, so we're gonna do this real quick, but check, check this out. Look at that, a couch and a bed. As if I needed all this stuff, the simple old me. All right, I gotta get back downstairs because we gotta get to the factory. Sorry y'all, back to a no photo area. Basically it. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys could hear everything, but that was basically the rundown of the Taylor factory. So here we are back in the main meeting hall. Bunch of whole bunch of guitars, but check this out. So this guy, this dude right here, is Bob Taylor's very first acoustic that he built. Alright? Something he built in high school. Dude built this guitar in high school, man. So good, crazy. And then this is one of my personal favorites. The old Liberty Tree guitar. Made in 2002 using 400 year old Tula Poplar. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful guitar. Got a little bit of the, the old 
Declaration of Independence, you know, however they say in French. And that'll be it. All right. Like I said, sorry if you guys couldn't hear too much. Big thanks to this kind of gentleman right here. What's up? Let's bring it in. Take Thank it you down. so much. Yeah, yeah buddy. Yeah. It's the end of the tour, back at the hotel room now. Good tour, lasted about an hour altogether. Um, whoops. Super informative. Answered a couple of new questions, um, totally debuted the new Taylor Grand Pacific. Sorry, I've been driving a lot today and that was rather sudden. When I pulled up, I was here for maybe 10 minutes before they, yeah, maybe 15 minutes before they picked us up in the van and we were right to the Taylor factory. Um, they're gonna do dinner for us, super cool. Uh, and that's gonna be like 5.30 or so. And I brought my bass, as you guys saw, as I showed you earlier. Brought my Merrick Standard Precision Bass, uh, and I'm just gonna sit and practice. Um, yeah, practice for a couple minutes before dinner, practice a couple minutes tonight. Might try to get up tomorrow morning and go down to the beach for a little while, and then I have another meeting tomorrow morning at like 9 or 9.30. So uh, it's gonna be a lot of stuff going on, I'm pretty short period of time. So, like I said, I'm just gonna sit and, uh, and practice a little bit. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's that for now. Hey guys, hey everybody, good morning. It is day two of Taylor training. I'm uh, just packing up my stuff. Got bags, what have you. I gotta put back together, assorted camera equipment. Totally went through one of the batteries yesterday. Totally burned through one of the batteries yesterday, so. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna kinda start packing up and then they're hosting a breakfast for us, which is super cool, super, super cool. Uh, they're gonna do a breakfast for us and then a couple more hours of training for the unrolling of the Grand Pacific acoustic. Uh, and, then, um, and then I'm back on the road. So it is 8.30 right now, been up for a couple hours. Kind of just sort of rolling around playing on my phone. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm gonna go downstairs, I'm gonna get some breakfast, drop this stuff off in the car. I have to check out of my hotel room right now. Um, and then uh, they're gonna meet us downstairs in the conference room. As I said, we're gonna uh, do a couple more hours of Taylor intensive training and then, uh, and then I'm back on the road. At least a three hour drive today, at least. We'll see what happens, so. Uh, cool, I'll shoot a little bit more. Uh, and I'll see you guys in a little bit. people here all in the same kind of training. A lot of super cool guitars. Um, got a little ditty bag. Oops, sorry, whoop. Got a cool little ditty bag. Check this bad boy out. So they sent us a sweet, awesome little Taylor bag, backpack. So thanks to them. Picks, we never have too many of these. It's been, it's been a good day so far. Let's take a look at some guitars. This is the, what, K? 14 CE Deluxe. Stylish little beveling right here. More guitars than I know what to do with here. Oh, there's Andy Powers. is actually to kind of take a step back and talk about B-class bracing. One of the things we talked about was that B-class bracing was a platform, it was actually a platform for designing guitars. Where were you as a builder with X-bracing to cause you to even look for something else? I love those guitars, but you know, we're guitar makers, so we want to keep doing this. And I'm not dead yet, so I wanted to see if I could build a better guitar. See, you know what? What else I got? It's like I just used everything that we could think of to do. We did them all, which is quite a feat, but the guitar isn't done yet. There's still more that we could get out of this thing. I was thinking, how will I break this thing apart to make the next iteration that we'd see eventually, or can it even be done? It felt like driving in circles, going, well, if I alter this little part, then I get this bad side effect over here. If I 
try and improve this and it pops up over here. There's only so much that I can do with this context. That's a way to break different aspects of the guitar's functionality into things that you could easily manipulate. A conventional Lex Brace flat top design, you can't do that. So I'm looking at this and going, well, I want longer sustain, and I want more dynamic range on the guitar, I want more volume, longer note. I can't have one without, like, it's this give and take thing. So I figured out a way to how to isolate those, and we got some really nice benefits out of that. It was, uh, the intonation thing was probably the biggest surprise for most people. That was something I had, I had discovered years ago, and for the life of me could not figure out how to make that happen in a factory guitar. For years, when I would build or work on an electric guitar, get the frets right, the nuts right, pick up height, get the string height and the neck relief, all the details right. Then you drag your strobe tuner out and you set the string compensation. You play the guitar and it's great. I'd work on a flat top guitar and I would work to the same degree of accuracy. Get the frets right, nuts right, relief is right, everything's on the money. And I'd set the string compensation, but I'd play it and it wasn't as good. <laughs> it drove me mad for years. <laughs> I have no clue why this just is not as good. Anything that I can measure is telling me that it's as good, but I can hear that it's not. It took me a long time to figure out that's a function of the way this guitar is working. This guitar is just inherently not as in tune with notes that I play. Solid body guitars are pretty easy to make play in tune because there's not as much going on. You won't hear that as much as, as you would on a flat top. So when I started isolating different components of a guitar sound using the B-class system, I kind of was, in a way, I was kicking myself going, this is what I should have done all along. Of course, you build it more like an electric guitar or more like an art shop. Guess what? It'll work a little more like that. Uh, great. Hindsight's 2020. Your original vision for the design of B-class bracing started with the trade-offs between sustain and volume on an x guitar. Yeah, that's a good jumping off point. When I was thinking about that, at the same time, as I was working on making you know, version two of a great guitar, I had been listening to a lot of the records that I grew up with. And my dad's a huge country, western swing, bluegrass fan. It's good work music. And my wife and I were working on our house nights and weekends a lot. I was listening to all these old records. This is great. This is super cool music. I don't have any guitars that would make this sound. And I know that there are no guitars that make this sound. Because I've worked on those guitars. In some cases I've worked on the, like the actual guitars that made some of these records. It doesn't sound like that. It doesn't sound like the record. What I'm looking for is this composite sound. An instrument played through a mic, EQ, compressed, filtered, mastered. In real life, very few guitars can sound like that. I mean, many of you might not know, before Taylor, Andy had a long list of clients who would give him, not only were you yeah. building your own guitars, but yeah. you were repairing yeah. vintage instruments. Yeah, primarily for collectors and pro players, a couple of museums. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd restore pieces. Like there's, a, there's a few of them on display, pieces that I've worked on in the Making Music Museum up in Carlsbad, and there's a big museum in uh, Vermilion, South Dakota. I've worked on a lot of old guitars, I've seen a lot of them torn apart. And there was, like I said, there was a couple of times when I got chances to work on like, This was the guitar on this record, but it's not really what I'm after. I wanted to build what amounted to a very highly refined version of that familiar sound. So the first guitar that I tried building with the B-class idea was based on a treadmill. Third one was this guitar. That's kind of a fun fact <coughs> when you think about B-class. We launched it with the Grand Auditorium shape. It's actually not where B-class started. It actually started in this Dreadnought Exploratory. The original guitar four or five years ago was actually the Grand, uh, the ver a version of the Grand Pacific. 
So it started out in this pursuit of the sound yeah, that it's talking about. It started with uh, this concept of wanting something different. I like these guitars, I like those guitars, we should make these too. I, I started working on that B class idea and I built a bunch of these. So we thought, okay, well let's build let's build grand auditoriums like this. That's the shape that we're most known for. Let me revoice this or retune it for that shape and make it the most Taylor. It's like the turbocharged version of that classic Taylor sound. It's what I consider the high fidelity, like a high resolution version of a modern acoustic guitar sound. It's kind of like, like the piano of guitars, where every note has a very clearly defined shape. The notes that come off of this guitar are a different shape. It's more like taking that chord and playing it on an organ, where you don't really hear the individual notes anymore, you hear a chord. You hear the relationship between the notes. Because every one of these notes is very broad, it's a wide note, and it blends into the notes next to it. But the actual sonority of the timbre of an instrument, that's what makes it unique. So this guitar is largely middle of the road size, the lower bow is about the same as a GA, about 16 inches, conventional dreadnought-ish territory. Same with the upper bow. Slope shoulder dreadnought is like the closest thing that we have to compare it to. So that's what we're calling it, a round shoulder dreadnought. Okay. Let's just talk a little bit about the sound of the, of, uh, the GA. This is like the Taylor modern, high-fidelity, high-resolution sound. It'll do that if you want to play... the way a lot of people do. It'll do that. But if I played a single chord, they sit where they sit. If I play the exact same voicing on this guitar, I'll arpeggiate it so you can hear each note individually at first, and you'll hear them quickly blend together. It's hard to actually pick up which note is which now. So it's a whole different kind of thing. I'm not talking between this time. on a few of the things that I wanted to change because I built a lot of dreadnought guitars. I like dreadnoughts. They're cool. They're fun. They're, they are what they are. But there's parts of them that I do not like. Typically, in front of a microphone, you've got a conventional dreadnought. You play the thing. The entire low end you cut off. You just take that out because you can't use it. I mean, I describe it as like this whoosh of air, this puff of air. Some guitars will make it and it's just not that usable. I want everybody to do this. It'll feel a little funny. Take your hand. Put the tip of your middle finger on your nose. And say the word pop. What did you feel in your hand? You felt a bunch of air. Microphones hate it. That's why a vocalist in a studio always has a windscreen or a pop filter in between a microphone and their voice. Now try this. Put your hand back there. Go in rapid succession. Pop, 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 pop. Now try this. Go ma, 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 ma. That sounds a lot more musical. That's a lot more usable. And so that whoosh of air was something I wanted to correct 
and take away from a conventional dreadnought. I don't like that part. So when you play this guitar, I want a powerful, strong low end. But I want every single note to be good. So using the D-class idea gives us the ability to tune this thing out and go, yeah, that big whoosh of air, that Helmholtz resonance, we can push that so that it's not interfering with anything. So the second part that I wanted to change was usually a big guitar is not all that well balanced. So if you play chords or notes up here, that big puff of air wants to swallow this up. It's kind of a physical phenomenon. I won't, I won't bore you with all the details. But I wanted every single note to be a good one, all over the register. So it's not weak and thin and anemic up top. Yeah, it's no good. Initially, I was thinking, OK, it's the bluegrass player's guitar. I sent one to, uh, to Edge. He's playing with YouTube, and immediately I get this call from the Dallas's tank. It goes, you need to send a backup. Like this one's going to the show tonight. I'm freaking out. Like I'm thinking, well, that's interesting because here's one of the most modern players I could think of. A guy who's amazingly dedicated to his craft. Really, this is your flavor. This is this is what you're after. Oh, all right. I started off thinking, well. You know, this is a really neat sounding guitar and all the all my traditional friends, they're going to like this. But it turns out, so many of those same qualities that we like in one style of music, if they're musically useful here, they tend to be musically useful. A great instrument is just a great instrument. Tell us a little bit about what does the Builder's Edition on a Grand Pacific <coughs> include and mean okay. to you? I want this guitar to be really comfortable to hold. I want it to be really comfortable to play. But this design has to be a non-cutaway version. I wanted it to be a full body guitar, ideally symmetrical. In this case, there's a different neck profile. When I play, same with most other people, you wrap your thumb around the neck more. So down here, something resembling a V-shaped neck, even if it's subtle, is most comfortable. <coughs> By the time you're up here on the fingerboard, a V is not comfortable because your thumb is in the middle of the neck. So this round shape up here feels really good. The fingerboard edges are all rolled off. Like the neck shape rolls right into the fingerboard playing surface so there's no clear, sharp corners. Even the, the heel, it doesn't have a sharp corner right up the middle. Even though there's a non-cutaway, I want every last bit of reach that I can get out of it. And so that round heel made it way more comfortable when your thumb runs into it. That's actually why we're not putting a strap button over here in the classic place. When you have that, you lose a little bit of upper fingerboard accessibility. So those aspects, the chamfered off body edges, everything has this soft, comfortable, rounded off feel. It makes a guitar hug into you. Even though you notice the bridge on this guitar is a little different. A little like the classic Taylor shape that we know and love, but even that has been altered so that if you're rubbing your hand on it, there's no points, no sharp corners or anything. The whole idea is I want somebody to <clears throat> kind of fall into this guitar.
Hey everybody, we are now back here at the BGR headquarters. Thank you very much for watching. Big thanks to Taylor Guitars for sending me out as well, putting up in such a nice hotel room. I really had a great time, uh, saw some pretty cool stuff. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, if you did like the video, please give it a like and uh, please do comment. Let me know what you thought, if there's anything in particular that you guys would like to see at some point, um, you know, cause I'm still trying to grow it. I'm still trying to, uh, you know, try some new things. So uh, hope you did enjoy the video and as always, thanks very much for watching.